Hi friends, how are you today? Happy New Year! Da, 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 da. I know, yay, wow, we made it to the next level. Woo, ah, I don't know. Okay, hey, I'm Bailey Sarian, if you didn't know, and today's Monday which means it's murder mystery and makeup. So today's episode is a part two. Technically you can like watch this on its own, you know, but like you could watch the first one. I was gonna upload it uh, back in December, but I got like randomly really, really sick and then ended up in the hospital. It was nuts. It was nuts and uh, not ideal. So then I just was like, I'm gonna just chill for the rest of December. And so I did that, but I'm here with part two now and I'm totally fine. Thank you. I know. <laughs> I know. I don't know what I know, but I just, I know. Okay, so that happened. And now I'm back with part two. And this is like, out of all of my murder mystery makeups, honestly, this story is like really high up there on the list. Like, I, I think this one, for me at least, was probably the, this is the worst story. This is bad. So disclaimer, I don't even know what not to disclaim because this story has it all. It's bad, it's real bad, it's all of the bad. So you've been warned. Okay, so before we get into it, I have a word from today's sponsor. Ah! Hi guys, just popping in here really quick to mention our sponsor, Melt Cosmetics. Melt Cosmetics has been a company that I dreamed of working with and they reached out with the opportunity that I thought would never come. Oh my gosh, I was like, what? And I am so excited to introduce the collection that I got to do with Melt Cosmetics. Now this, first of all, is available right now, okay? I've been working on this for quite some time and I just wanted to create like a palette and a collection that I wanted to use, <laughs> okay? I wanted all matte, like I knew what I wanted. I was like, here's what I want, all matte, okay? I want these creamy, rich colors, something different. Like give me that like grunge, baby poop looking colors, okay? Like that's what I wanted. And Melt Cosmetics gave that to me. So we have the Fatally Yours collection and the Fatally Yours eyeshadow palette comes with all these beautiful shades. There is this really fun plaid imprint on the shadows. All of the shadows are named after a poison because I was kind of feeling the whole like, if looks could kill or the idea of something being um, so beautiful, but so poisonous. Like that was kind of the inspiration I was going for with this whole collection. Sounds silly, but uh, let me live. Also, we have individual items. There are four different lipsticks, vegan, cruelty-free, creamy, beautiful color payoff. I love the lighter shade because I use it as like a mixing medium if I want to tap it on the center of my lips with the darker shades. Plus the cute part is that the bullet on the lipstick, it features my lips with my piercing on the teardrop and then it has the signature like plaid all over. I didn't even want to use it. I was like, this is so cute. I love this. So then there's the Deadly Kiss Liquid Set Lipstick Minis. Now these are liquid lipsticks and they're the minis, which I like because you know, you don't have to commit to like a full size. I really love the lighter shade because again, like I use that as a mixing medium to tap onto the center of my lip. So like for today's lip, I used Weeping Fig all over and then I tapped Foxglove like on the center and it gives you just this little like, ooh, it's fun, like play with it. It's just makeup, it washes off. So like live a little bit, but you're gonna love them. Also in this collection, there are two gel liners, the Onyx gel liner and Nightshade gel liner. Both are vegan and cruelty free plus talc free. The Nightshade gel liner specifically, it looks purple in the pot, but I promise when you start playing with it and it dries, it turns almost indigo. Also, there are two glitter gels available. We have Wisteria glitter gel and Boomslang glitter gel. Wisteria looks like a disco party on your eye and then Boomslang is like snake vibes or like leaves, but I was going for garden snake, garden snake. And also on top of that, there is a Fatally Yours bag. Come on, it's so cute. It also comes with a long hook if you wanna wear it as a side bag. It's perfect to put all your products in. It's cute, wear it out. I've been wearing it like just wherever, you know, it makes a good little bag, it's cute. Plus I love carrying it, it's a little hard. It's like, mm. All of this is available on meltcosmetics.com right now. And I really just hope that you guys love it as much as I do. I am forever grateful for this opportunity. I can't say thank you enough to you guys for being here and in my life uh, throughout these years, it really means a lot. I hope you really like this collection. And again, a big thank you to Melt for wanting to partner with me. I mean, 
I'm so thankful. So I'll link down below where you can get this melt cosmetics.com. But other than that, I'll be, I'm gonna do a look using the products, okay? So let's go. Snowtown part two. So in today's video, I'm gonna use the melt products and create a fight. I wanna, I wanna do something like fi uh, fire is what I'm trying to say, fire. Okay, great. If you're ever curious to know what products I'm using, I'm gonna list them down below, okay? Great, so here we go. Buckle in. We're in the year 1997 and we're in the town of Adelaide, Australia, where John Bunting had already murdered five people. So John had two sidekicks to do the murders with him. His BFF, Robert Wagner, and his stepson, Jamie Vlasakis. That's John's stepson. John had brought them in to like help him kill anyone he considered a quote unquote pedophile. But then John got bored of that. And then he decided to like widen his demographic going from just killing pedos. And now he was like, well, anyone who's gay, trans, overweight, disabled, and slash or someone he determined was quote unquote ugly, this was now his target. As you can imagine, the rest of the story is a shit show. So the five murders had already happened and there was a common thread between all five victims. They were all linked to a woman named Vanessa Lane. Now, Vanessa was, to be honest, like she was not a good person, okay? Actually, you could probably say she was terrible, a demon, depending on how you look at it. She, and I'm not making this up, she was pretty high up in an underground pedophile ring. Yeah, and it was like in Adelaide. When needed, Vanessa would like go out in her town and look for teenage boys who appeared vulnerable, you know? She would go up to them, befriend them somehow. I don't know how, you know, she would make some um, big promises to these, to these kids. Look, in the end, these kids would be auctioned off to the highest bidder in this pedophile ring. So, yeah. Pretty shitty. So Vanessa and John, they knew of each other and John had made it very clear that he did not, he did not like Vanessa and Vanessa, she, she could tell, but she was also like super uh, afraid or intimidated by John. It, like she knew what he was capable of. So as a way to like deflect from her own wrongdoings, Vanessa would give John any information and names about uh, pedophiles in the area. I mean, she's involved in the ring, you know, so she, she knows who's involved and starts like giving out names. So at this time, Vanessa was, live. she's 42 years old and she was living with an 18 year old quote unquote man named Thomas, who she claimed like was her lover. So Vanessa and Thomas had been living together for about five months. It was obvious to everyone, like Thomas is really young, a little too young. I mean, yeah, she's 42, he's 18, you yeah. know? On top of him being young, Thomas, he had suffered from some like pretty severe mental health issues, like um, schizophrenia, paranoia, and was just like very vulnerable. So it also appeared to some people that not only is this guy young, but like Vanessa seems to be taking advantage of this poor guy, but like no one ever did anything. Well, once John got word about this little living situation, oh, it made him deeply upset. So one night, John and his best friend, Robert, they go visit Thomas when Vanessa was out doing something, okay? So Thomas is alone at the house and they invite themselves over and they're talking and hanging out with Thomas. And they essentially convince him that Vanessa was a predator and that she was taking advantage of him and he should be like aware. So they were telling Thomas all of this stuff and they're like, hey, don't worry though, we have a solution for you. 
a solution to break free from her hold. You know, because they were there to help Thomas, of course. With some convincing, they get this poor young man to participate in their plot to murder Vanessa. They're going to murder her. On October 17th, 1997, John and his best friend, Robert, arrived over at Vanessa's house where Thomas was at, right? So the guys, they get right into the house and when they're inside, they just like completely ambush Vanessa. They got her in like a choke hold. Uh, they like are holding her down and just start beating her. Then at one point, someone grabs a roll of like the gauze bandage, you know, like the roll. It gets shoved into her mouth. So she's like gagging and choking. This is when Vanessa like is looking around for Thomas and she realizes that he was in on it. Like he was helping the guys. It was like not her beloved Thomas, the ultimate betrayal. The guys, they spend the next few hours just torturing her, just torturing. Slow little tortured things like pulling out her toenails with pliers one by one, like that kind of torture. They were into this. So the guys force Vanessa to call up her mother, okay? During the phone call, it was said that her mom could tell something was wrong just based off of how Vanessa sounded. She just didn't sound right. Vanessa like wasn't saying anything and um, she could also hear Thomas in the background. So it was like, uh, maybe I'm just overreacting. It's probably nothing. During this call, Vanessa just started spewing just nasty words towards her mom. Just being nasty, like saying, F off, never speak to me again. This beauty blender is my phone, I guess. Never talk to me again. Not only that, she was moving to Queensland and that she should never come looking for her. And then bam, like hangs up the phone. So after the phone call, the three guys then continued to torture Vanessa until she eventually gave up all of her bank account information. So once they got this info, they felt that she was really no use to them any longer. So John, pretty much the leader of the pack, ended up strangling her to death. Then afterwards, they end up taking her body and they laid it down on like the area rug and they ended up rolling up the rug and just like leaving it rolled up in the living room. And then the guys just took off. So here's another super messed up part. So around the time Vanessa made the phone call to her mom, you know, like cussing around stuff, the guys also made her make another phone call to her ex, who Vanessa was still very close with. And on this call, Vanessa asked her friend to come to her house a couple times a week, pick up her mail and then feed her dogs. She was going out for on holiday, as they say. And she would be gone for a while. Like I said, she's super close with her ex. So it wasn't like a weird, it was normal, you know? So the friend totally agrees and she's like, yeah, whatever. And as the weeks go by, this friend would go to her house, get her mail, Vanessa's mail, let herself into Vanessa's house because she had a spare key, feed the dogs, put the mail down, you know, and then head out. But listen, because for this friend to walk from like the front door to the kitchen area, they had to step over that rolled up rug the rolled up rug that Vanessa's body was in. Literally this friend was stepping over her for weeks. I was like, what? what? Could you Im Could you imagine? Could you imagine? No, look, the, the friend had no idea. You know, no, she found out later and it's like, ooh, but I was just like, oh my, God. Oh. Oh. I really don't have words. That's why I keep making noises. Anyways. After the murder, John ended up stealing Vanessa's car. And if anyone questioned John why he had 
her car, he would just tell them that he bought it from her for 50 bucks. I know a total bargain, 50 bucks. So at the time before her murder, Vanessa, she couldn't work because she had some kind of debilitating pain, which prevented her from working. So she was on welfare, which if you remember from the part one, uh, a lot of John's victims were also on welfare. And this is because John saw it as like a monthly payday. During Vanessa's murder, he had gotten her bank account information. And with this, he would have his BFF Robert go to the bank and have him make withdrawals from her account every month, like routine. So it's like he was making money off of these murders. Oh God, I wasn't thinking about it like that, but geez Louise. So when Vanessa disappears, people notice, okay? Like it wasn't like she was just forgotten. People were like, where the hell did she go? Because like she was very well acquainted with people because she was so involved with that pedo shit, you know? So they're all like, where's our girl? I'm looking to do my thing, I'm, you know? So these people are like, where is she? She never goes missing. So someone opens up a missing person's case and then they just kind of wait. So a couple of months go by and there's really been like no movement on Vanessa's case. But that is until one day the unit was doing like a routine review of all of their active missing person cases. During the missing person search, they came across the name Clinton Trezais. In part one, we mentioned his story more, but here's how like the police connected the, the dots. Vanessa used to date BFF Robert. During their relationship, Vanessa also dated Clinton Trezise. So police are like, okay, let's look more into this Vanessa person. You know, maybe she knows where Clinton is. And that's when they realized that she too seemed to be missing. Okay, so this was interesting, right? So the missing persons people, they do some more digging, like snooping around, and they end up looking into Vanessa's bank records. What they find was that money was still coming out of her account every single month, and it was happening at the very same ATM machine every single time. So they're like, okay, if we're looking for Vanessa, then they're most likely, you know, gonna find her here. And it's like, yeah, makes sense. So the police, they end up setting up a video surveillance situation at that ATM and they wait. So some time goes by and they end up collecting the surveillance footage that was set up and they, they get a hit. So this is when they realized that the person who was actually making the withdrawals was not Vanessa, but instead it was Robert Wagner, AKA John's BFF, who if you forgot is also like super neo-Nazi and like absolutely also psychotic in the story. Yeah, that guy, it was that guy. They're like, uh oh. We found something. So the police, they did their work and they were get, they were onto something here, right? And they wanted to keep looking into the situation, but unfortunately, at the time of this story, the police department was underfunded. So they made a lot of cuts where they felt, where they felt it was needed. So with that, they originally wanted to tap Robert's phone but they didn't get approval on it. It was like, sorry, no money, no. Also, they originally wanted to have police, like undercover police, follow Robert for some evidence. But again, they did not get approval for it. But what they did get approval for, <laughs> the unit approved for the police to uh, allow an undercover, uh, surveillance, okay? They were like, sure, you can do that. You guys can follow Robert, but only once a month. Once a month, wow. 
they'll get the job done. So the police, you know, they're on to him. They're on to this robber guy, just at a really slow pace. So with Vanessa dead, Thomas, remember Vanessa's quote unquote lover, now needed, he needed somewhere to stay, you know? He couldn't stay at the house. So Robert, BFF Robert, offers Thomas to stay with him. He's like, yeah, you can come over and stay with me. Some say Robert had taken him in because, because he really saw himself in Thomas. And maybe he could be like an older brother type, but Robert's actions say otherwise. So who knows if that's true. I mean, he may have also seen Thomas as like collateral damage for all we know. But this whole living situation, it wouldn't last, it wouldn't last long. Thomas had a handful of mental health episodes during his stay, which eventually pushed Robert like over the edge. He just could not stand this guy anymore. So he was like, I'm gonna do something about it. And yeah, he's gonna. So it's like January of 1998 and Robert asked Thomas if he wanted to go out to the park with him. It was like, not that far in the Adelaide Hills. So Robert invites Thomas and he's he to, he's down. He's like, okay. So the two of them end up going and they get there, whatever. Nobody really knows exactly what happened out there, but some kind of kerfuffle went down in the trees. Like Robert must have confronted Thomas at some point, said some words, uh, because at some point, he forces Thomas to stand on top of a box while Robert put a noose around his neck, Thomas's neck. Yes, yes, he did, he did. Then Robert kicked the box from under Thomas's feet and it was said that he just like stood there and watched. Shut up, shut up, I know. Huh? We talk about a lot of psych like messed up psychos here, but this one, like this, these people are t like top tier. I, 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 what do you say, huh? The very next day, Thomas's body was found, but unfortunately, truly unfortunately, Thomas, he did, he had a history of mental illness and a history of like numerous suicide attempts. So with that being said, his death was listed as just that, a suicide. Unhinged. Okay, hate to be annoying, but I mentioned this in part one, but our main psycho here, John, he had a stepson. The stepson's name was Jamie. Now, Jamie at times would help John out with his murderous ways. And because of this, John, you know, looked out for his stepson. He was family, so he was like protective over him. That's like the summary of their relationship at this point. Okay, so when Jamie was 19 years old, he decides he's gonna move out and live on his own. So he ends up renting a room from this guy named Gavin. Now, Gavin, he was, living on his own, right? He spent a lot of his years in and out of different mental institutions. He had drug problems and it was just not an ideal living situation. Now, unfortunately, Gavin, he loved heroin. Yeah, it was his thing, you know? And of course, when he does it or when he did it, he would do it like within his own home. With Jamie now living there, he was like really introduced to it all. And it didn't take long before the two of them were shooting drugs together, like all of the time. John kind of knew what was like really going on in the house and he absolutely despised this Gavin guy. I mean, he's thinking like he introduced my stepson to heroin and bleep blah bloop, you know? But Jamie would go on and on to John about like what a good friend Gavin was and that he was pretty much his best friend. So because his stepson liked him so much, John said that you know, he tolerated Gavin for as long as he could. 
but that really doesn't like seem to last long. So I guess there was this one day when John had gone over to the house to visit, you know, his stepson, Jamie. So he goes over and while he was there, John goes to sit on the sofa. But when his butt had hit the seat, he realized that he had just been stabbed by what seemed to be a used needle. I think any of us would be fucking pissed, right? But this, but it, John said this was the very, the very moment he knew that Gavin needed to go. He had had enough. So here they go again. So on a night in April of 1997, Gavin, he was dry, he drove home from somewhere. He drives home, he parks his car outside and he falls asleep in the car. This was perfect though, because John and Robert were like right there waiting to ambush him. So when they see that he's sleeping, they're like, great, perfect. And they just, they attack. The two of them, they jump on him, they are beating him up, and then they end up like driving off uh, with him still in the car. Oh, side note, I know I like keep calling like Ro BFF Robert and stepson Jamie and like, but look, these nicknames, they help me. They help me because there's so many names in this story. So they drive off in the car. Look, I don't know whose car it was, but either way, it's John, BFF Robert, and Gavin all in the car. And John's driving and he drives them right to John's house. In John's backyard, he had this pretty good sized shed where they decided, okay, this will hold uh, Gavin captive in the shed. Yeah, so that's what they do. While in the shed, they just go off, okay? They're just beating up Gavin, they were strangling him, and they were going at it for like a minute because Gavin was not going down without a fight. At some point, it was said that Gavin was able to like reach out and grab a screwdriver and he ended up stabbing John in the hand with it. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, yeah. But sadly, the two guys would end up killing Gavin Porter in the shed. Yeah. So here's how messed up these people are in the head, okay? Stepson Jamie, who also is Gavin's roommate, remember? He comes home from wherever the hell he was. He comes home, pulls up, parks, whatever. And when he arrives, he notices that John and Robert were waiting for him, but they were in Gavin's car. So it was kind of like, hmm, that's weird. So they somehow convince Jamie to hop in the car and they tell him like, hey, we want to show you something that we did in the shed, haha, <laughs> you know? So Jamie gets in the car, they go over to John's and they take him back to the shed to see what the guys had done. And Jamie looks in the shed and he sees what they had done, okay? He's, he sees what they had done. He sees his roommate, Gavin. Uh, he sees his body just there. And it obviously makes Jamie visibly upset. And it was said that this made John giggle, laugh, LOL, telling him to essentially like, just get over it. What Like, this is what we did. Ha 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 ha, you know? Psycho. And then the guys convince Jamie to help them hide the body. Jeez Louise. So the three of them decide to hide Ga or put Gavin's body in one of those big old uh, plastic, not plastic, but like the industrial chemical type of barrel. So they put him in one of those. Honestly, this should just be called the and then story because it's like, Literally, and then, and then, I don't know. But after this, it was kind of like, okay, you know, we're all done. Thank you. And they were on to the next one. 
So maybe after Gavin's death, John and his stepson, Jamie, they seem to like get closer or something because Jamie started to open up um, to John about his biological father and also his brother. And he's sharing with John about his upbringing and what it was like. And it was awful, like everyone else's, it was awful, okay? So stepson Jamie tells John that when he was 13 years old, he was raped by his older brother, Troy. I know, shocking, shocking, awful, sad, just awful. John hears this and he's like rubbing his grimy little paws together like, tee -hee -hee. you know, don't worry, I'm gonna take care of that for you. So John and his BFF Robert, they have their eyes set on their next target, Jamie's older brother, Troy. So one night in September of 1998, John and his BFF Robert, they, they like crept into Jamie's room where, he, where he's obviously sleeping because it's late at night. So they wake him up out of his sleep and they're like, wake up, we're gonna go kill Troy. Like no time to process, huh, what? But that didn't matter. They gave Jamie a pair of handcuffs and a club. So Jamie's like, okay, guess I'm going now. They also had another guy helping them that night. He was a lesser member within this murder cult. His name was Mark Hayden. And honestly, I'm so deep into this with all these freaking different names that I, I can't even remember who he is. But what we do know is that he was there that night to help. So this foursome, they head over to where Troy, Troy, Troy is a hard name word for me to say, Troy, Troy. <laughs> So this foursome, they head over to where Troy lived. They sneak into the house, they get into his room where he is sleeping. That's when Jamie, steps on Jamie, handcuffed Troy, his brother. While he did that, John and Robert then tied him up. I know, I'm, I'm just, I really struggled with all the names and stuff. So, you know, just go with me. So the four of them, they just went at it. They were beating the guy up for as long as they fell. Okay, they didn't, I don't know. They were just taking out all of their anger. And then at some point they decide to move Troy out of his bed and move him into the bathtub. He's all tied up and stuff and they're holding him down. And John, he seemed to like, he loved it. Because, okay, because with all of the victims, he would do some something sick. And with Troy, they took some pliers, they crushed each of his toes. Again, like just one by one. And while all of this was happening, they were able to get Troy to give over his bank account information and also his PIN numbers. And also they recorded all of this information that he spilled onto a tape recorder. Yeah, they brought a tape recorder. Also on the tape recorder, they, John, uh, he has Troy record a message saying that he was moving away. Like essentially he was, it was like for his mom. It was like, mom, I can't handle it in this house no more. I'm going to see the earth before there's none left. Wish me luck, but into a recorder. So they get his bank info and the recording they need to like, send his mom if he if if she's wondering where he's at. So, it was said that John wanted some background music to his murder. This sounds fake. This sounds made up. I know. I know. So he puts on some background music. He told Mark, the one I forget about, to play one of his favorites, the album Throwing Copper by the band Live. No idea, no idea, but that's what they put on. So Robert and John, they end up putting a rope around Troy's neck. And after some struggle, Robert ended up strangling Troy to death. Just absolutely psycho. 
just absolutely psycho. Psycho! After Troy dies, the four guys, they work together to dismember his body. They also skin it and like toss it all into two different large barrels. I just had like the biggest brain fart. I'm just now realizing that Troy was technically John's other stepson. He killed his other stepson. I guess they didn't have much of a relationship, the two of them, like John and Troy. And at times when I was reading about this story, it was like he was referred to, Troy was referred to as like Jamie's brother. I don't know. Anyways, so just realized that. Okay. Alrighty. Sure. Great. I mean, out of all of the deaths, uh, Troy's, his was like the most dramatic. And listen, it continues. So one day, Forgettable Mark is having people over at his house. So the family's there. His 18-year-old nephew, Fred, is there. John comes over with his stepson, Jamie. You know, every, the gang, they're all there, hanging out, chatting. People, it's a party, whatever. So at some point, Fred was walking across the room. Okay, he's walking and Fred accidentally like lost his step and he started to fall. So, you know, what do you do when you start to fall? You reach out and try to grab something. At least I do, whatever. But that's what Fred does. He reaches out, he's falling, he reaches out and he grabs something near him. And it turns out it was Jamie's leg slash knee. Like Fred had rested his hand on it. You get it? To catch himself. I mean like, yeah, super awkward and embarrassing, but whatever, it happened. Whoops, sorry, you know, sorry. Well, well, John was right there witnessing this encounter play by play. He watched this fall, the hand placement, and he was not happy. Oh, nay, nay. I haven't used a nay, nay in a while. Nay, nay, he was not happy. So based off of this, because this is how fucked up John is, based off of this, the way Fred, quote unquote, grabbed Jamie's leg slash knee, John decided that Fred was indeed 100% a pedophile. I wish I was kidding you. I wish I was, but I am, no, seriously, seriously. Ah. <laughs> uh. Yes, this, I mean, what? But John had determined this and was set on it. Like you could not change his mind. Fred was a pedo. But then I thought about it and like not to be annoying or anything, but at the time Fred was 18 and his John's stepson, Jamie was 19. So pedo who? Well, John quickly gets his murder gang together and he tells them that they have their next target, Fred, poor Fred. So on the night of September 17th, 1998, Fred, he's at home and he's getting ready to head out for the night and go to a party. It was even said that before leaving, he told his mom he was hoping to get lucky, which I was like, okay, you said that to your mom? Good for him, good for him. So he tells his mom he's hoping to get laid. Okay, you know, all right. And he heads out for the night. But before stopping at this party, he makes a pit stop to meet up with John, his BFF Robert, forgettable Mark, and stepson Jamie. So Fred heads over to meet them. They had told Fred like, hey, we need a little favor from you. Like, will you meet up with us real quick? So Fred does, he meets up with them real quick. John tells Fred to hop in the car with them and go um, and go somewhere really quick. And John ends up driving them straight to his house. Once Fred was inside of the house, John and BFF Robert, they're like, oh, hey, we're, we'll be right back real quick, hold on. So Fred was just like hanging out with stepson Jamie, you know, just shooting the, shooting the shit. So while the two of them are just like, you know, doing their thing, chit-chatting, 
at some point, stepson Jamie pulls out some thumb cuffs he had just laying around in his pocket. And he's like, look what I got. And he shows, he shows Fred. And Jamie is like, look at how cool these are. Yeah, I have them. Tee hee hee, you know, like, wow. Remember, they're young, they're 18 and 19. So it's like, they're impressionable. So Jamie is showing him like, oh, look, ooh. And then he tells Fred, oh, I, I bet you, I bet you wouldn't put these on. Like, I bet you won't do it. Try, I bet you won't. Peer pressure, you know? So Fred, being the youngin he is, he's like, oh, I'll do it. And he, he like takes the thumb cuffs and he puts them on. I know this might be the dumbest thing you've heard all day, but I really didn't know what, I've never seen thumb cuffs before. I missed that one. Um, so I looked it up and I was like, oh, they're literally thumb cuffs. Blew my mind. The more you know. Do, 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 do. Great. So Fred has his thumb cuffs on. Unfortunately, this was actually a trap. You see, once those cuffs were on, that's when John and Robert, they jump in and they ambush Fred. Poor Fred. Oh, he's just, he's just a young kid, you know? Jeez. So they drag him into the bathtub. They got Fred all tied up in the tub, they cut off his clothing, they then pull out the tape recorder and press play. Now on the tape was a recording of Troy who was crying and like pleading for his life. So they're making Fred now listen to this. Do you remember the toy box killer? It was an episode I did a really long time ago, but do you remember that story? If you remember, it's giving very that, right? Like same family, that's not a good thing. Okay, anyways, as they did with like all of their victims, they would take turns torturing Fred. This time they got like really extreme. Someone had brought in some electric nodes, like mini jumper cables, essentially. So someone brought, brings this to the party and what they do, you see, they end up attaching Ugh, the cables to Fred's lower region. And they would shock him over and over and over again. Things were just said to be sizzling, like not even lying. Sizzling was a word that was used. And I was like, oh, sizzling. So then John puts the tape recorder in Fred's face and tells him like, you need to admit that you touched little kids. And Fred refuses. He's like, hell no, I'm not saying that. Well, plus like, I'm not, well, whatever. But he refuses. And what they do is every time he would refuse, they would shock him. And John would turn the, the machine, whatever, higher and higher every time Fred said no. So I mean, just brutal, okay? Just brutal. So of course, at some point, Fred reaches his, his limit, his breaking point. And he ends up just like admitting to whatever John wanted him to say, just hoping that the torture would stop. Now him admitting to whatever the hell John wanted, it did stop the, the electric shock situation, but the little torture that happened afterwards definitely still happened. Like the guys would put their cigarette butts out like all over Fred's body, just burning him. And just other really extremely disturbing things. They forced Fred to say into the tape recorder. It was something along the lines of like, yeah, mom, I don't wanna see you again. I'm going to Perth, leave me the F alone. Bye. So once they're satisfied with the tape recordings, then John picks up a pair of pliers and crushes Fred's toes slowly. Then he takes a jack handle, like a heavy piece of metal and hits him over the head, which crushes it and kills Fred Brooks. I'm speechless. Just brutal, oh my God. Now with Fred's disappearance, it doesn't go unnoticed. He was only 17 years old. His mother got uh, very worried when he didn't come home for dinner that night. 
So his mom had called his cell phone numerous times and was getting no response. So she decides to head down to, to the police and file a missing persons case, um, just report it and wait. Which, geez, you know, that, uh, that's that got to be the hardest part, to just sit and wait and hope something happens. Anyways, so she calls Fred's phone a handful of times, and then eventually she gets a phone call. And this phone call was coming from Fred's phone. She's like, oh, shit. So she answers, um, and John was on the other end, ready with his tape recorder. So... Hello? John hits play, and it was the recording of Fred saying, hey mom, like I'm going to Perth, and leave me the F alone. And it's Fred's voice, you know? And uh, so she was hurt and offended at the mean words that were said, but it was Fred's voice. So she assumed, okay, well, like, I guess he just doesn't want to talk to me. So she ends up going down to the police and, and uh, closes the missing persons report. So her mom just decides, you know what? She needs to stop worrying, stop looking for him and just wait for him to maybe re return one day. I know, I know. These guys are getting away with everything. So Fred, he was on a welfare system where he got some money while living with his mom. But John, John did some math Boop, 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 boop. And he realized that if Fred were declared unhoused, then they could get double the money. Payouts um, at the time in 1998 for unhoused youth was 265 Australian dollars, which would be paid every two weeks. So, you know, like 530 Australian dollars, that's a lot every month, but the gang didn't, they didn't have access to Fred's funds that easily. So look, I don't know, this sounds like Scooby-Doo or something because John had his stepson, Jamie, go down to the welfare office and impersonate Fred. Yes. Now, apparently, I guess you didn't need much ID because they believed him. They believed they were talking to Fred. What, 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 yep. They're like, yeah, this is Fred. He said so. So Jamie, playing as Fred, got evaluated by a doctor and the doctor determined that he was telling the truth, that he was indeed unhoused, and also that he was dealing with schizophrenia. Yeah, like, boom, that, do, 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 approved, great. And now here's the, oh my gosh, here's the other part. Since he was so quote unquote unwell, they told Fred he only had to check in with the system every three months instead of every two weeks like normal. What, what, what? How is everything working in these guys' favor? It's what? So once they get this all done, stepson Jamie opens up a bank account in Fred's name and then had the money come in to this bank account. And in the end, this was just another source of income for John and his murder crew. I know I've never seen murderers thrive so much. Just everything is working for them. So at the time they were having Fred plus Vanessa's money coming in. And John was getting about like a thousand bucks a month from these payouts. And it wasn't bad, you know, but of course he wanted more. He was not satisfied. He made it sound like it was about money, but it's like, no, he just wanted to kill somebody. It was like his favorite hobby. So he was just like, I need more money, but sure, whatever. So only a few weeks after killing Fred, he started to get that itch again, okay? So he needed his next victim and he found it right next door. It was his next door neighbor, a 28 year old man named Gary O'Dwyer. Now Gary in John's eyes was a perfect victim because 
Gary had a rough upbringing. It's not funny, but if you have been paying attention, you understand. Okay, so Gary had a, a tough upbringing. Um, it was said he was like abandoned when he was an infant um, because he was, quote, medically complex, end quote. And whoever just didn't want to deal with it whatever. He had been adopted into like a loving family when he was about two years old and then grew up in Adelaide. And things were okay until 1994 when at the age of 15, Gary was in a horrible hit and run. Yeah, just someone just hit a 15 year old and just drove. He was left for dead on the street. He survived. But in result, he suffered like some serious brain trauma, brain injuries. It left him not just physically disabled, but also prone to mental distress. So Gary's been through some shit. So after the whole hit and run situation, Gary ended up receiving a lump sum of money and then he was placed on permanent disability. So after that, he settled in um, at a house like right next door to John's place, bringing us back. So uh, Gary's health, obviously not great. And because of this, it kept him pretty isolated from everybody. And like the only real contact Gary had was with his mother. Like nobody really knew the guy in the area. Now Gary wasn't being accused of being like a pedo um, or anything like the, the previous victims, but John just was looking for any excuse to kill. So when it came to Gary, he's like, well, he's disabled, therefore he needs to go. And I think he just saw him as an easy target, really. So John uses his stepson, Jamie, once again, and tells him that he's gonna go next door and befriend, befriend Gary. Yeah, he's like, go talk to him and become friends. Gary never really got visitors. So when Jamie came over, the two hit it off and they became like buddies, you know? And Jamie told him like, hey, you know, we should hang out. I'll bring my friends over. We can have some drinks. Like, it'll be cool, man. And Gary was like, oh yeah, it sounds great. Like, absolutely. And that was the plan. So, in late October in 1997, stepson Jamie, John, and BFF Robert, they all show up at Gary's house. And they're like, hey, you know, we brought booze, you know, let's hang out, it's nice to meet you. So Jamie, Robert, and Gary, they all start drinking together. But John, he decides to stay sober, you know, he wants to remain fresh. He's on the clock. So the guys, they're drinking and they keep offering Gary, you know, drink after drink. And it didn't take much. I mean, it was like 20 minutes later, Gary was like sauced up, okay? He is drunk. Now this is perfect. This was the moment John had been waiting for. Gary is drunk. So what does John do? He attacks. He like goes up to Gary and puts him in a chokehold, then throws him on the ground. And Gary was a petite man. So it was like, this was easy for John. So then once uh, John has Gary down, that's when the other guys join in and get Gary pinned to the ground because they are absolutely sick humans. Like they did with all the previous victims, they wanted to torture Gary. John tells his stepson, Jamie, to go grab the electric cables out of his, out of his car. The shocking thing, he's like, yeah, go get it out of my car. So Jamie does that. And when he comes back, the gang turns on some background music unsure what, but turn on some music. Then they clip the shocks onto Gary's chest and his arms. And they do the same thing to Gary that they did with Fred. They shock him to get the answers they want. They put their cigarette butts out all over the body and also did some mutilation of the lower region. Of course, they have Gary do a bit for 
their tape recorder, you know. The guys gave him a script to say like, hey, I'm Gary, I'm a, I'm a pedo. Now I'm feeling happy, I've, I've had treatment. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But they got that, okay? And then most importantly though, they got all the bank information they needed from Gary. Mark, again, the guy I keep forgetting about, Mark, he shows up to the house at some point and decides to participate. So this would go on for hours until finally Gary's body just gives up and he dies. They end up putting Gary's body into one of those big blue barrels that they've got, their favorite little trick. And then they end up leaving the barrel in John's backyard. So after they were done dropping the barrels off, they head back over to Gary's house. And these bozos, they straight up steal all of Gary's furniture. His furniture. Like a sofa, like his furniture, like they steal all of his furniture. Okay, you know? <laughs> I know that's not the oddest thing in this story, but I was like, the furniture? That's when they get like his ATM card, the bank stuff, and also like any cash that was laying around. Okay, so here we go, next one. So, John and BFF Robert, they're having the best of times. They are loving this killing spree that they've been on, and they're really looking for who's next, and you know, they found their person. Okay, Mark, the forgettable one, he was part of the murderous crimes. Um, occasionally he would participate, but also Mark was married. He was married to a lady named Elizabeth Hayden. Well, Mark, he saw some shit and he needed to talk through it. So at some point he goes to his wife, Elizabeth, and tells her like, what's really been going on? Oh yeah. He gives her all of the details on how John and Robert had killed a guy and buried him in a salt flat area. And he's just telling her everything that went down. Now I'm not sure what Elizabeth's reaction was. I don't know. Like, like if you heard that, well, I don't know what you would do. If I heard that, God, what would be step one? I guess pull out the tape recorder and be like, babe, what'd you say? That's crazy. Can you repeat that? Anywho, so Mark really just tells his wife everything. And then for some dumb reason, I don't know, Mark then goes to John and he's like, look, I told my wife about one of the murders. I'm sorry, but I just need to tell her. Look, this was all John needed. He was now like, boop, must get rid of Elizabeth. I mean, to be fair, on top of that, uh, he was looking for a good excuse to get rid of her. It was said that John hated Elizabeth with a passion. He thought she was trashy and extremely unattractive. He would refer to her as, quote, uggo, end quote. So this, you know, this was upsetting to John. I mean, how dare she? So John is excited and he goes to Robert and tells him who their next victim is. And that was that baby. So on November 21st, 1998, John asked forgettable Mark to do him a favor. Uh, this favor would be out of town but he needed him to do it for him. So this would get Mark out of his house for a few hours. So Elizabeth would be home alone. So Mark takes off and Robert and John are just kind of waiting for, for their moment. When they felt ready, they go to uh, Mark's house and they knock on the door. Elizabeth answers and she's like, oh, you guys can come in, but like Mark isn't, isn't here right now. And within seconds, Gens. Bozos attack Elizabeth and drag her into the bathroom. Now, look, they had made this whole like background music part of their thing now. So they do that. They put on some, some music. And once the vibe is feeling right, they go back to attacking poor Elizabeth. So they end up breaking her, her nose and just like beating her up real bad. Eventually, 
Robert, again, pulls out the tape recorder and has her record some lines. They have her say, leave me alone. Um, I'm all right. And then also some like rude things like, you're a dirty slut, F you. Just a variation of uh, terms people use. So they get this recording and then Robert shoves a, sh a sock into her mouth and they put tape over it. So she's choking on it. And I guess this made fucking John laugh. I can't believe this guy is real. Like, uh, uh, uh. then Robert ends up putting a rope around her neck and then strangles her until she dies. Okay, so after that, they then take her body and they put it in one of those huge ass garbage bags you know the, the the ultra big one so they put her in there and then they take her remains and place it underneath her house i guess there was like an open pit area underneath the garage so they put her in there and they were like oh we're, we're just gonna put her here until they could get one of the uh the barrels they were out so under the garage in a pit works so Mark is out of town and he's just like getting this bad feeling that something is up. Like he, you know? So he finds a local payphone because he wants to check in with his wife, you know? Give her a ring. So payphone, boop, 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 no one answers. And like Mark just doesn't like this, right? He's got that funky feeling. So he decides to just head home. So he drives all the way back home and when he gets there, He's met with John and BFF Robert. They were at his place. He's like, whoa. So these sickos, they don't even wait. They don't even wait long. They go right up to Mark and they share what they did. They're like, this is this is what you, we did to your wife. Ha ha ha. Then John takes Mark. Um, and shows him where they placed her body under the house. She's showing him like, look, there she is. Ha ha, ha ha. Because he's, he, it was said that like Mark's initial reaction was to laugh because he was deeply uncomfortable. But after that, it was like, okay, so what did Mark do? Like what happened after that? I was trying to find out more. I guess like nothing really happened because Mark didn't want to ruffle any feathers, you know? Plus he was technically involved in the murderous situation. So if he went to police or something, he was like, I'm, I'm just gonna out myself. I don't want to do that. So it kind of seems like after they killed his wife and stashed her body, he just kind of went on like everything was totally normal. These people are, what? Yeah, like I just can't believe. <laughs> okay, all right. But listen, as time was going on, people were checking in like, hey, where's Elizabeth? I haven't seen Elizabeth in a while. Like, where is she, where is she at? She seemed to just vanish. So not sure who, but someone had placed a missing persons case. This time, for once, the police seemed to actually be involved. Like they were really snooping around trying to figure out what was going on. John was aware that police were kind of snooping, you know, and and he started to get like really paranoid, right? And John and his BFF Robert are thinking, maybe this is the time we should move. So look, all of the barrels and bodies were literally in John's backyard. And at this point he was like, I've got way too many, I need more space. And on top of that, summertime, meaning is about to get stinky. So John decides, I need to find a better place to dump the victims. I'm sure he's not thinking it like that, but he needs, he needs a better place to dump these barrels. So he loads all of them, all of the barrels and shit, all up into his land cruiser. And he calls up his BFF, Robert, and asks him like, hey, I need you to find me a place to hide the, the barrels. 
So Robert tells him, you know what? Don't worry. I got a guy. And he had a guy. This guy let Robert and John park the land cruiser outside of his house. And they ended up leaving the car there for months. <laughs> months. Eventually, the guy, the guy calls up Robert and is like, hey, you need to you need to move your car because shit reeks, okay? So it's getting real stinky and there's a problem. So Robert tells the guy like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so sorry. It smells like that because our friend, uh, Forgettable Mark, had illegally killed a bunch of kangaroos and that's why uh, it stank. Oopsie, you know? He put that on Mark. <laughs> okay. Anywho, so... I guess this guy totally, he buys it. So the car stays put, but John knows like he needs to figure out a better dumping site um, ASAP. So he finds one in a nearby town called Snowtown. Population 500 in 1999. Maybe it's more now. 500. John thinks, ooh, this is a perfect area. I mean, there's not a lot of people. It's great. Within Snowtown, John comes across an old abandoned bank and it's this big building and it has a vault inside and it's perfect. I mean, and it was available for rent. Ah, oh, wow. So John tracks down the owner, makes him a deal, pays two weeks rent up front and was given the keys to the building. And he, like, he made sure to put the rental agreement into forgettable Mark's name. Yeah, so it's in Mark's name. John literally used everyone else to do his dirty work. So there was like no paper trail of him, no fingerprints. He was the ringleader. But this old bank was a pretty, pretty large building. And also it was like made out of brick. It was big. And inside the bank, there were different rooms but there was, one of the rooms was like the vault. So this is where they decided they would put all of the bodies and the barrels. So once they got those keys in hand, John and Robert, they went, they picked up their, the Land Cruiser, which I don't even want to imagine how stinky that drive must have been, right? Like they head over um, to the bank and load the vault with all of their the barrels. So at this point, I was really hoping that this would be the end, but unfortunately, no, no. Nope. So some time goes by and John gets that urge again to kill. And at this point, he was so off the rails that he didn't really need any excuse, quote unquote excuse, to kill anyone. It was like, just give me a name and I'll kill him. So uh, that's when John's stepson, Jamie, gave him a name. Okay, new group of people here, so just go with me. So stepson, Jamie, his mom remarried and with that marriage came a new stepbrother to Jamie. So Jamie's stepbrother, his name was David Johnson. David was four years older than Jamie. Apparently it was said he was nice. He was a stable guy, which if, again, if you've been paying attention, very rare for this, for this story, but everyone had something nice to say about him. And at the time he also had a fiance that he loved very much. And the two of them were getting married like real soon. So stepson, Jamie tells John about David. So David's on his radar and he's, he's looking for any reason to again, hate David. So what really irked John about David was that David took pride in his appearance. That really pissed him off. He was clean cut. He was a well-maintained man. How dare he? So this was upsetting to John because according to him, if you cared about what you looked like, it meant that you were gay, according to John. Yes. If you cared about what you looked like, especially as a man, you were gay. And John hated gay people, so he's like, yep, he's got to go. What? Yep. 
So he comes up with a plan for their next attack. So John tells his stepson, Jamie, that he needs to call up David and ask him to go over to Snowtown with them. And on this phone call, he would pretend that there was like this super great deal on a computer over in Snowtown, and he wanted David to come along with him. So Jamie agrees with John's plan and makes the phone call. When David gets this invite, he's totally down to ride out with Jamie. So they plan it, okay? So on May 9th, 1999, the two drive out to Snowtown where Jamie takes David straight to the newly purchased bank. He gets there, the two of them get out and he leads David inside. So John and Robert are already inside and they say like, hey, are you here for the computer? Yeah, hey, yeah, it's in the back, come on don't go no so they go into the back and that's when john and robert they attack david they handcuff him john tells david not to panic as if that's gonna like help but he tells him you know we're, we're, we'll let you go as soon as you give us your wallet and your bank account information so david get, gives it over and once they get that information the fucking tape recorder was pulled out. Ugh. And once again, they hit record and they have David say a bunch of names, first names, including Linda. And Linda was his fiance. So they have him say like a bunch of names and then they have him say a, a bunch of numbers and random words. All of them could be used as like one word answers if someone were to call looking for him. So they just got like a bunch of variations. So once they were satisfied with that, they had David get, get on the ground where a plastic sheet had been laid out. John puts on the live album again as background music so they cut off david's clothes and then john takes off david's socks and then he takes like the dirty socks and stuffs them into david's mouth and then puts tape over it so the guys they take turns kicking david in in like the nuts and just kicking him all over they beat him they punch him all of it this time though they decide not to use the electric shocks it's like Yay, I don't know. John told his stepson, Jamie, to take David's ATM card, run over to the bank, try and use it, and see if like the pin number they got was legit. So stepson, Jamie, he's like, okay, I'll do it. And he goes and he does it. So when he comes back, that's when Jamie sees David dead. This was very upsetting for Jamie. He said he wasn't expecting that. So John told his stepson like, look, look, this is what happened. David tried to attack me and I had to use self-defense and strangle him to death with a belt. I had to. So it's like, okay, all right. So then John orders his stepson and his BFF Robert to take David's body into the vault. Once they they get in there, John tells the gang, okay, look, we're going to cut his body into small pieces. And they're all excited about it, like, yay. But stepson Jamie, he was not. He was not okay with this. He was really upset and didn't want to participate. I mean, David was his stepbrother, you know? So it was just a lot for him. So Jamie decides to step out while John and Robert go absolutely psycho, dismembering the body, then placing the parts into various barrels that were like all around the room. So everything was just everywhere. Get this. So Robert, BFF Robert, he was feeling a little curious and decides to cut a little bit of David's flesh from his leg. So he does that and he, he like puts it in his pocket. That way, when he got home, he could fry it and eat it, which he fully did. Oh yeah. He said when he got home, he used a frying pan to heat that bad boy up and then ate it. So, 
They're doing it all. They're doing it all, they're doing it all. Okay, what now, Bailey? Well, in the following days, uh, people were questioning like, where the hell did David go? And John and his stepson, Jamie, they of course had an answer, okay? They told anyone who asked where David was that he actually ran off with another woman. He left behind all of his all of his belongings. He left his fiance and he just took off with this woman. People just believed it, you know? People just believed it. To be fair, like this is totally before social media and all that. So it's like when someone moved, you just never saw them again. <laughs> Anyways, but still, people believe that that he just took off. John, though, he was using David's ATM card and he would steal over $32,000 from his account. Okay, are you ready for this next part? Because, girl, this literally sounds like an old episode of like Jerry Springer, what I'm about to tell you. Listen, follow me here, okay? John was having sexual relations with this woman named Gail. Gail was Fred Brooks' mother. Yes, the Fred that was murdered. Gail was Elizabeth Hayden's sister. Yes, the Elizabeth that was murdered. Gail was her sister. Now, John was having relations with Gail. Talk about a full circle moment. Wow, huh? I think it's safe to say she had no idea, right? I didn't look into that, actually. She she didn't she didn't know, right? I don't know. These people are funky. It's like anything could go at this point. If I didn't know any better, I would think this whole story was made up, right? I know. So, listen. The end is near. Everything had been going great for John and his murdered crew. I mean, they were getting away with a lot. But what they didn't know was that the police, they were right on their butts. Finally, remember, they were just working at a very slow pace, like a turtle. So at some point, police, they ended up getting approval to have stepson Jamie under surveillance. Yeah. They actually recorded the phone call between John and Jamie, where the two of them are talking about luring David to the vault to be murdered. They get that on tape. Police also hear a phone call that was made by Jamie to John, saying that he and David were on their way over to the bank vault, like letting a heads up. And it's like, oh my God, finally, finally, right? Yeah, but. Here's the thing. It turns out that back in 1999, it was illegal in Australia to surveil phone calls in real time. The phone call could be recorded, but it would have to be recorded first. Then someone can come back whenever and they would listen to the recording. So it, was, it wasn't in real time. So it's like by the time they, they hear this phone call about the murder with David, it's like time had passed. It's like, just missed him, darn it. According to police, they didn't have the manpower or money to have these guys on surveillance 100% of the time. Yeah, just a freaking mess, all of it, a mess. Okay, but finally, these detectives get a major break because they hear a phone call where Robert and John were planning on meeting up and heading out to Snowtown to go to the vault. So this is perfect. And these two detectives, they were on it. They decided to like try and catch them while the two guys were on their journey. So these detectives are driving and they were able to locate their car and then follow them. So they do all the way to the bank. And it's like, oh yeah, baby, it's game over. Now, listen, I'm not sure, and I'm sorry, I apologize. I've come to you with uncertainty because I'm not sure if the police intercepted John and Robert's plans or if they like waited until the, until the guys left to search the bank. But either way, the detectives and whatnot, they get inside 
and they look around and that's when they come across the room filled with barrels, okay? And also the barrels, they seem to be filled with acid and many bodies. It was horrifying. Anyways, it wouldn't take long after this discovery for John, BFF Robert, and forgettable Mark to be placed under arrest. Finally, right? Jeez Louise. Now, when media got word of the story, oh, it completely blew up. I mean, to be fair, it's absolutely one of the worst things ever. So I could, I could see, I could see that, you know? But let, like at any press conference, there would be a swarm of people, people hanging off of rafters, climbing onto roofs, just trying to like get a shot of these murderous people. Like, who are they, you know? They wanted to know. And many of these photographers, they did get the shots. I mean, there are photos out there of the three of them handcuffed, um, smiling together, looking like old pals. Someone's like flipping off the camera. They just look like best friends hanging out who happen to be handcuffed. It's just bizarre, it really, it really is. At this point, the only person who hadn't been arrested was stepson Jamie. Now the police were definitely on his case and knew that he would crack eventually. So police questioned him and they end up questioning Jamie for six days and he cracked. He spilled everything. I mean, everything. It was said that he had like a total breakdown during the interrogation. And afterwards when the police and everyone like left the room and he was alone, Jamie had pulled out uh, some heroin that he had snuck in and tried to purposely overdose. Like he knew he was in some deep shit, you know? But also pretty bold to bring hair on into the police station, you know? I was, I was like, oh, okay. Anyways, police were able to intervene and Jamie would live. But authorities, they did believe that like Jamie was also a victim to John, but at the end of the day, he had participated in murder. So Jamie was placed under arrest for the murder of David Johnson. So John Bunting and Robert Wag Wagner's, their trial had lasted for about 12 months and it was the longest and biggest trial in South Australian history. That's what was said, as I know. Congratulations, you, you did it. There were over 200 witnesses called to the stand and so many like horrible details that were shared during the trial. Finally, in December of 2003, the jury came to a verdict. John was convicted of 11 counts of murder. Robert, BFF Robert, confessed to three of the murders, but in the end was convicted of 10 murders. Stepson Jamie, he pled guilty to four murders and he was great help during the trial, you know, as their star witness. He was sentenced to four life terms with the possibility of parole after 26 years. In 2004, forgettable Mark, remember? Uh, he confessed to two murders, but in the end was convicted of six counts of assisting with the murders. Woo! So where are they now? So John, being the ringleader that he was, he ended up getting sentenced to 11 life terms without the possibility of parole. Bye. Robert, he was sentenced to 10 life terms with no possibility of parole parole. But in 2019, Robert, he went to the Supreme Court and applied for a non parole period, arguing that it would help with his quote, mental well being. End quote. Uh, his request was denied stepson Jamie. So he received a quote, lighter sentencing for coming forward with all of the information, right? He'll be up for parole in 2025. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Like that's actually uh, next year. I was like, oh shit, he'll be 46 years old at this time. So we'll see. Mark, he was sentenced to 25 years with the possibility of parole 
after 18 years. Technically, he didn't kill anyone. He just participated, you know? So he got like the lesser of the gang. He will be done serving his sentence in May of 2024. What? Thoughts? I don't know. Good luck with that. Um, hey, let us know how it goes. Let us know. So listen, that's the end of this horrible, horrible fucking case. This is the worst. This is the worst. And these people are absolutely, absolutely beyond sight. I don't even think there's a word for them. They are just, I've just never like read up or learned about someone, some people with so much hate like really just deep hate. Like it's just, wow. The torturing, that's what gets me, you know? So shit, man. What are your thoughts on stepson Jamie and forgettable Mark getting out soon? You know, I don't know. How, how do I feel? I don't know. I think I, I would just mind my business and hope for the best, I guess. This fucking story has been requested so much over the years and I don't know why I never really looked into it but I did and wow that was fucked up <laughs> thoughts feedback suggestions let me know down below I just think those guys should be put down right jeez louise like my look it's cute okay <laughs> well now I'm gonna go take a long, hot shower. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. You make good choices, please be safe out there. Love and appreciate you. I'll be talking to you guys later. Bye.